I want to talk just for a minute before we get into the message this morning about our vision as a church. Now, this is uh, in your bulletin every week, somewhere right here on the back, you see our vision. So I just want to talk about that as something that came out of our Acts 2 journey that the leadership of the church went through um, the past year. And it's really very important. It's a vision for our church family. It's a vision for each one of us individually. There's three statements in this vision. The first is that we, our vision, put it this way, our vision is to experience God's Spirit. We want to experience more of God's Spirit in our lives. We want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guides us. The Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit enlightens us. The Holy Spirit encourages us. And we could go on and on. There's no end of being filled with the Holy Spirit. You can say, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, you can be fuller filled. <laughs> uh, there's no end to knowing more and experiencing more of the Holy Spirit. We want everyone to experience and grow in experiencing God's Spirit. Secondly, our vision is to spread God's truth. God's Word is truth. Our world is filled with lies. Our world is filled with falsehoods. More, now more than ever. And our mission as a church, our mission as individual believers is to spread God's truth, to share his truth in the midst of darkness, the light of God's truth to those around us, personally talking to people about Jesus, sharing the truth of God's word as it applies to our lives, to other people's lives. It's not just a matter of not saying the wrong thing, it's a matter of saying the right things. God doesn't want us to be silent. He wants us to spread His truth. And finally, to share life together. As believers, we have eternal life right now. And it's a life that goes on forever. We're going to spend eternity with one another in heaven. But God wants us to share life right here today and now in our church family. Being here as we worship together on Sunday mornings. Being involved in small groups be involved in the other activities and ministries of the church, sharing life together. God doesn't intend for us to be what we might call Lone Ranger Christians. He wants to share life in His family, in the body of Christ. So that's our vision. So let's, let's say it together, okay? We're going to say each of these things. I want you to say it along with me. Our vision is to experience God's Spirit, spread God's truth, share life together. Okay, now you've got it memorized, right? So say it a hundred more times and you won't forget. <clears throat> Let's begin uh, with prayer before we begin the message. Father, today we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth. We thank you for giving us your word. We pray, Lord, that you would enable me to present your truth in a way that we can understand, a way that we can apply it to our life today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today we're going to talk about how God's Word advances despite persecution. We're going to explore a really a powerful truth that has been evident throughout history. It's that God's Word advances no matter how fierce the persecution is. Now, why is there persecution? I mean, what is persecution? Persecution is opposition against God, opposition against His church, opposition against believers in our world. Why is there persecution? Persecution comes because there is a hidden, unseen spiritual warfare between Satan and his forces and Jesus Christ and His church and believers. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now there's a promise to put on your refrigerator. Right? <laughs> it is a promise. Uh, it is a promise. Who are those who desire to live a godly life? It's believers. Do you desire to live a godly life? Let's see who wants to be persecuted. Do you desire to live a godly life? Raise your hand. Okay? Most of you raised your hand. Uh, you're going to be persecuted. Who are those who desire to live a godly life? It's believers. I mean, if you don't desire to live a godly life, you're not, not a believer. All of us desire to live 
godly lives. If a person, well, let's just say believers will be persecuted. Now, it's in one way or another. Persecution comes in, in many different forms. Jesus himself talked about persecution in Matthew 5, verse 10. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. When we are persecuted, now notice it says for righteousness sake, not for doing wrong things. Uh, when the police pulls you over because you're speeding, you're not being persecuted. So, for righteousness' sake, we are blessed. It might not feel like a blessing, but God's word says, Jesus himself said, you are blessed. What type of persecutions are there? Well, when people revile you. I mean, that's saying really bad things about you. Uh, when they tell lies about you. Say things that are false about you. And how should, we, how should we react? Should we grumble? Should we complain? Should we seek to take revenge? God's word says rejoice. Rejoice when you're persecuted. Because you have a great reward in heaven. John 15 verse 20. But Jesus also says, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Was Jesus persecuted? Yeah, they killed him, right? That was the ultimate persecution, isn't it? Jesus was persecuted throughout his ministry. Did he ever do anything wrong? No. Did he only show love and compassion for people? Yes. But still... He was persecuted. And Jesus said if he was persecuted, then we, as followers of Jesus, are also going to be persecuted. If you don't feel like you're being persecuted, maybe you should let your light shine a little more brightly in the darkness. And it will come. If you're watching the news at all, you surely see that Christians are being persecuted more than ever in our country. And the answer is not to be quiet, to avoid persecution, to avoid people saying negative things about you. God desires for us to let the light of his truth shine through us to enlighten people around us. We need to trust God's power when we are persecuted. Today we're going to look at a passage in Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So this was direct government persecution of believers in the church. It says he laid violent hands on some. Well, what does that mean? It means he put them to death, just as he did with James, the brother of John. James, the brother of John, was one of the twelve apostles. And certainly he was one of the leaders in that church. And he was the first apostle to die as a martyr. And when it says he was killed by the sword, it means they cut his head off. He was beheaded. That's the way the Romans did uh, what they would might call capital punishment. And so the persecution of the church, the death of this beloved apostle, must have been difficult for the early church. But this was not even the end of the persecution. In verse, let me see here. Uh, I guess I'm missing one here. I'll read it for you. Verses 3 and 4. When he, that's Herod, saw that it pleased the Jews, that he killed James, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when they had seized him, that is Peter, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out. To the people. And so the killing of James pleased the unbelieving Jews. They didn't like the growth of Christianity. And so Herod thought, 
I'm going to do the same thing to Peter, another leader in the early church. So Herod's intention was to bring Peter out, show him to the crowds at the Passover when a lot of people were there, have a show trial, condemn him to death, and have him publicly executed. That was the plan. When evil leaders or governments cannot silence believers, what do they do? They seek to kill them. Of course, that's what they did with Jesus. And that's what they do down to this day. How did the church respond to this terrible threat on Peter's life? Verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. The church did not give up. I mean, they had lost James. God had taken him home to heaven. They didn't give up. They prayed earnestly that Peter would be rescued from this threat of execution. But something happened. Verse 6. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, bring Peter out to the crowds, of course in chains, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And sentries before the door were guarding the prison. Pretty secure, wasn't he? Uh, sleeping, bound to two Roman soldiers, soldiers outside of the cell. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, that's next to Peter, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. So at the last moment, the night before Herod was going to bring Peter out, to face the crowds and ultimately to be executed, a miracle happened. Peter was very securely guarded. I mean, chained to two, two soldiers with, I'm sure, their swords, equipment at their side, others outside the door, and suddenly this angel appeared. He had to hit Peter to uh, wake him up. Wake up, Peter. And uh, he said, uh, he told him to get up, get dressed, his chains had fallen off. Apparently, you know, this angel was able to put the, I don't know, knock people unconscious or put them in such a deep sleep they didn't notice what was going on, the soldiers there. And um, <clears throat> he was to follow the angel. And so the angel led him out of the cell, past two more guards. The angel opened the prison gate in front of him, which was locked as well. They passed through that open gate. And once Peter got outside of the prison... The angel vanished. Now, all this time, Peter thought he was seeing a vision. He didn't realize that this was really happening. But once he got outside the prison gate, he realized that God had freed him from prison by a supernatural miracle. We must trust in God's power amidst persecution of any kind. God is able to do things that we would deem impossible. He is the God of the possible. Persecution is increasing in America against Christians. Quite obviously, the news media on a whole is very antagonistic to Christians and biblical values. As many people get their values today, not from the Bible, biblical knowledge is at a very low standard. They get it from the news. That means that Antagonism is seen in people that interact with us right here in St. Louis when we speak of biblical values. Just about any biblical value we put on our sign, uh, I don't talk about it much, we get basically threatening, hateful voicemails and various phone calls uh, that tell us how awful we are for presenting the truth. Now thankfully, and you might, uh, and this is always accompanied with a one-star review, okay, now, thankfully, in the past week or so, um, <clears throat> shockingly, actually, <laughs> we have reported these things to Google, and Google has been deleting these bad reviews, which they never did before. So, uh, thank God and pray for blessing on Google, okay? <laughs> because these are, you know, review is supposed to be the, uh, a review of somebody experiencing that church family, okay? If somebody comes here and has awful things to say after they hear me preach, you know, they can put that, and that would be, that's not going to happen, please. But, uh, 
That would be a legitimate review. But somebody who's never been to the church knows nothing about us uh, other than something on a sign and, and has all kinds of other bad things to say, obviously, is not a legitimate review. So uh, we must not let these forms of persecution silence us from spreading God's truth, either as a church corporately or in our lives individually. Our commitment is to keep on spreading God's truth every way that we can as a church. And I believe that God gives each one of us individually ways to spread His truth. The people who do not know God at all, the people that know God to some degree, so that His truth might grow in our city and in our land. We can spread God's truth to our relatives, Spread God's truth to our co-workers. Spread God's truth to our neighbors and our friends. Now, sometimes we may be hesitant to share God's truth. Why? We're afraid of damaging relationships. That might be a form of fear of man. God wants us to spread God's truth. And when we do it in love, there's different ways to spread God's truth. (laughs) When we spread God's truth in love, because we really care about a person, God's going to use it. It's not going to damage relationships. It's going to cause people to see and hear the truth. It's going to plant seeds in people's lives that ultimately will bring a harvest. So we must speak God's truth in love, believe in God's power, that as we share His truth, God is going to use it. We might not see an immediate response, but that, those seeds that are sown into people's lives are ultimately going to bear fruit. Now, God's plan is greater than any person. Verse 11, when Peter came to himself, he realized what was happening was real. He's outside of prison. He said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. So the Apostle James, one of the twelve apostles, had been a leader in the church in Jerusalem, but he was now gone. But in God's plan, he rescued Peter, who became the next leader of the church in Jerusalem. Now why God allowed James to be executed and go to heaven, and he rescued Peter, I don't know. But that was God's plan. So Peter's outside of prison. What does he do next? When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. So the prayer meeting was still going on. And it appears that this was an all-night prayer meeting because everybody was sleeping in the cell and they were still praying in the middle of the night. Of course, they didn't realize that Peter was no longer in prison. And so they were still intently praying, God, please deliver Peter because they knew What would happen the next day if Peter did not get out of prison? The Bible indicates that what kind of prayer was it? Uh, It said in an earlier verse, they were praying earnestly. Uh, This was heartfelt prayer, probably prayer with tears. That God would move and rescue Peter. Now Peter went to the, as he went to the house... Uh, He knocked on the the gate, it seems, and um, there was a servant girl named Rhoda who came out, and she was so, it's Peter, she was so excited that she ran back in to tell everybody that Peter was there, leaving Peter standing outside at the gate. Well, she came to the people in the prayer meeting, and uh, they said, Rhoda, you're out of your mind. Uh, That's literally what the Bible says. You're out of your mind. There's no way Peter could be there. Yes, it was Peter. It's really Peter. And then they said, it must be his angel, which is really quite interesting. I I think maybe they saw a lot of angels in those days. Uh, And they thought, maybe it's an angel. And they didn't even seem very interested that there was an angel standing out. And Peter kept knocking on the gate. And finally, somebody else came to the gate and uh, saw it really was Peter. And they opened and let him in. And they were amazed to see that God had answered their prayers. Peter told them about his miraculous escape from prison. And so the prayers, the earnest prayers of the church, 
praying and praying into the night were answered by God by sending an angel to deliver Peter. Now the next morning came, verse 18, now when the day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. They let the prisoner escape. Now, it really wasn't their fault, but he wanted to execute somebody, so now he executed his own soldiers. God's plan is greater than any person. Even though James went to his reward in heaven, God was raising up another leader, Peter, and he protected him. So it's important for us to re- remember that God's plan is greater than any individual leader, whether that's in the church or whether that's in government or our nation. God's mission and his church will continue until Jesus returns to rule and reign. God's church will not be wiped out. People may be persecuted. People may lose their lives. Persecution may be really bad in one place or another, but God's church across this world will not be wiped out by evil. God's church will remain, will continue. And our focus, well, God puts leaders into positions of authority, both in the church and in nations. And our focus should not be in a leader, but on God to carry out his plan. That's what we want to see accomplished in our church and churches across the city and in our nation. We want to see God's plan accomplished for our nation. Now, God does raise up leaders to carry out his plans. And we need to recognize who those leaders are. And we need to support those leaders. Now, we must understand that all leaders are flawed. Right? In one way or another. Some more than others. I'm flawed, right? Every, every, only Jesus was the only flawless person to follow. That's why we follow Jesus. God raises up leaders. We must support leaders that are seeking to carry out God's plans. Our faith must not be in these earthly leaders, but God, our faith must be in God who raises them up and takes them down. God's plans are greater than any, any person and will be completed. And finally, we must believe in God's victory over evil. Verse 20, now Herod, this is King Herod, was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one accord. And they asked for peace. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. So not only was King Herod a murderer, executing different people that were innocent, He also was a very angry person. And God is about to act against the man who killed James. Verse 22, the people were shouting. The people in front of this open air um, speech by King Herod, they were shouting the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms, and breathed his last. An angel rescued Peter from prison. I don't know if this was the same angel or another one. It doesn't matter. There's myriads of angels. Another angel struck down King Herod for his murderous pride. You see, pride puts yourself above others. Pride is one of the things that leads to murder. Uh, You think you are the most important person, you are the king, you can do whatever you want, and you try to eliminate anybody who stands in your way. God dispatched this angel in response to the prayers of the church for Peter. And I believe God dispatched another angel in response to the church's prayers for continued deliverance from King Herod. And so that angel took out King Herod. Not only had he executed James, we had learned earlier in this passage, he probably had executed many other believers as well, and he would continue on with this. And this angel eliminated that threat. What happened with the church? Verse 24, But the word of God increased and multiplied. 
What does that mean? The word of God increased and multiplied. Did it mean there were Bibles all over the place? Uh, no, I mean, they didn't even have printed Bibles at that time. It means that no government, no king, no president could hinder the plan of God. The word of God is the truth of God that is given to us in God's word. And when people accept God's truth, believe in Jesus Christ, the word multiplies. The word multiplies as it's spread from one person to another. As a believer spreads it to an unbeliever, they accept that word into their lives. It changes their lives. And they, in turn, begin to spread that truth. That's how the word of God increases and multiplies. In order for the kingdom of God to expand, in order for his church to grow, the truth of God's word must be spread to more and more people. What does God's word do? God's word is truth. God's word, dis- the truth of God's word destroys the lies of Satan that keep people in bondage. And freedom, freedom comes to people and nations as the word of God increases and multiplies. We must believe in God's victory over evil, both here and now, and his ultimate victory when Jesus returns. So how can we grow in believing in God's ultimate victory over evil? Well, we need to continue to read God's word, to study God's word, and believe what it says so that God can build our faith. When we believe in God's ultimate victory over evil, we're not going to worry, we're not going to be anxious, we're not going to stress out about the future because God holds the future in his hand. When we see evil increasing, we give thanks that God is all-powerful And he's not surprised by what's going on. We must make sure that God's word is increasing in our lives and through our lives to others around us. When the darkness of evil increases, we dispel it with the light of God's word. Darkness cannot stand when the light shines into it. So God's word advances amid persecution. It demonstrates God's power. God's plan is greater than any individual. He will have the ultimate victory over evil. So in our own lives, in our city, in our nation, we're going to face trials, we're going to face challenges, we're going to face opposition. But God's purposes will never, ever be defeated. We must stand firm in our faith. We must pray earnestly. We must support God's leaders. We must trust in God's unstoppable mission. Our faith, our trust is not in a human being, it's in God himself. We must remain humble, we must love our enemies, we must give glory to God, we must continue to spread God's truth. And So my prayer is that God would help us to be bold and not silent in a time when God's truth needs to be spread in a dark world so that the light of the gospel can shine into more and more people's hearts.